Hey, let me just pray real quick for us. Lord, I, I just thank you again for a great morning. Lord, I pray right now, God, help our eyes to be open to see some stuff. Help our ears to be unblocked to hear some stuff from your word this morning, Father. Holy Spirit, have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, there was a poster um, that I, I came across, uh, recently read about, that is found in a lot of churches in France. Anyone ever been to France? Been along to a few churches in France? Okay, well, apparently this poster is found in lots of churches in France, and it says this. It says, by entering this church, it may be possible that you hear the call of God. However, it is less probable that, you will, that he will call you on your mobile. Thank you for turning off your phones. If you want to talk to God, enter. Choose a quiet place to talk to him. If you want to see God, send him a text while you're driving home. <laughs> Bunch of people there. I knew Rod would get it. I knew, and Pete, I knew they would get it. I knew they would get it. Hey, how many of you know that God actually wants a relationship with us? Do we all agree with that? How many of you believe that God wants a relationship with you more than you think that you want one with him? Yeah? God wants a relationship with us way more than anybody in this room wants relationship with God. And that's, I'm not saying that to say that we don't want relationship with God. I, I want relationship with God. But I look at the lengths that God went to to be able to have a relationship with me. Uh, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. God so loved me that he sacrificed, he gave up life for me. I kind of struggled, if I'm brutally honest, to just say, God, I'll give you an hour a day to just sit and hang with you. Um, So that tells me something, that, that God wants relationship with me way more than I want relationship with him. And I do want relationship with him. But the lengths to which God has gone to open a door for relationship is unbelievable. That he would do what he did for us through Jesus is quite amazing. And again, it's like a lot of things in Christianity. Every now and then it's good to go back to some of these things. Because we do certain things so robotically and they become so normalized that we can easily lose the, the amazement of who God is. We can, we can just begin to think, well, God is just God. And forget, no, God is actually God, you know? He wants relationship with us. We can, we can talk about it in a very uh, normative way. Yeah, God just wants relationship with us. And yes, he does. But hang on a second. That God, the creator of the universe, actually wants to have a relationship with us, with you this morning. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, God actually wants relationship with you. Now, the basis of any good relationship is communication. Communication is a part of any healthy relationship. Now, when I say communication, I'm not just saying verbal. Sometimes when we think communication, we, we think very much down one dimension, don't we? It's, 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 it's what we say. I don't know if many of you have been to Seacoast, but there's a lovely couple there, and they're deaf, both deaf. And I, I'll tell you what, it was always one of the things I loved when I used to pop in every now and then to Seacoast, was to see this couple. And they would be there and they would be worshipping and then they would be having conversations with each other, non-verbal because they couldn't speak and they were deaf. But, they would, but you could see, like when you watch them, I've seen them downtown and you see the love between, and how they express that love to each other without even the capacity of being able to use words. It's amazing. So when I talk about communication, it's more than just that one dimension of hearing some kind of an audible voice from another person or hearing some kind of audible voice from God. But God is by nature a communicator. And we know that from this collection of ancient documents we call the Bible. We know very clearly that God is a communicator. God likes to communicate. In fact, it's part of his nature to communicate. We see God beginning to communicate way back at the very beginning, the very first time, that the very first book that's been penned here, which we call Genesis Beginnings. And in Genesis chapter 1, Uh, In verse 3, the third verse, it doesn't take long for the writer to want us to know, hey, I want you to know something right up front. This God I'm writing about, the one that created, I want you to know right up front, here's one of his attributes, he's a communicator. He likes to communicate. Genesis 1, 3, it says, Then God said, let there be light. So God communicates, he speaks, he says, I wasn't there. But what I do know is that somehow God communicated that he wanted something done and it happened. 
It happened. You know, it's amazing in, it, when, when you read the, 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 these ancient documents, one thing that always fascinates me is that everything in visible creation is smart enough to obey God the first time he speaks except humans. Interesting. He says to the wind and waves, cease. And the waves went, what? Why should I? The wind went, whatever. Give me a good reason. Say it again. No, they just went, Oop. Everything in, created, in the created universe, the visible world, is smart enough to know to obey God first time every time, except for humans. Isn't that interesting? Except for us. But yet God is a communicator. And we see straight away in the very beginning that there's a connection between God's communication and creation. That when God communicates and speaks and says something, something of creation tends to happen in that space. So God says, let there be, and there is. God speaks, and it's not just about communicating. It's not the sole purpose. It's about creating. Because on the back end of God's communication is some type of creation. Something changes on the back end of God's communication. Hebrews chapter, one, uh, chapter 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand. So this is by faith. By faith we understand what we just read in Genesis, that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. You don't necessarily see words. When, I, when I'm speaking to you right now, how many of you are seeing words float out of my mouth? You're not seeing it. But it's communicating and you're hearing it. And in the same way that, that, that these worlds were created when God spoke, we didn't see anything. It was nothing visible. It was just God said and all of a sudden <coughs> there was. And then you go a little bit further on in Genesis to, to chapter 1, verse 26. It's not long before we realize that, hang on, not only does God communicate and everything happen, but there was communication amongst the Godhead. If you believe in a trinity, tripartite, bipartite, whatever, something happened because in verse 1, 26, it says, then God said, let us make man in our own image. So there's somebody, something there that's to us. He's not saying, let me make it. He's saying, no, let us. So God's communicating within the context of the Godhead as well. We see that. And two verses later, in Genesis 1, 28, after God created man, says God blessed them and then God said to them. He communicates to them pretty much right at the beginning. He starts to communicate with man. He starts to speak to them. God said to them. It's very clear right from the beginning, right through to the end, that the God that we have relationship with is into communicating. And there's some connection between his capacity to communicate and an end result of change. Whether it be peace be still to a storm and the whole environment changes and the storm stops. Or whether it be let there be and something that wasn't there suddenly happens. Or whether it be God speaking to uh, uh, Moses or whatever and saying, tap the rock three times and water will come out. And on the back of that obedience, what happened? Water comes out. God speaking and us obeying, and then at the end of that obedience, something changes. God never says anything just for information's sake. How many of you know that? So when God says to Adam, where are you, Adam? It's not that he didn't know where he was. He's God. You know? Oh, I'm hiding behind the tree. God's not asking because he doesn't know. You know? When God asks the disciples questions, it's not that he, Jesus, not that he didn't know the answer. It's never for information's sake. It's because God communicates, he speaks things with the goal of that communication being at the end of that tra train, I guess, is something's going to change. There's going to be some kind of transformation or creation or change. Jesus carried this kind of thought on. He, he assumed and made a few statements that make me again think that even in the New Covenant, New Testament, that we should still have an expectation that God wants to communicate to us. In John 10, 27, Jesus says this. He says, my sheep... Hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. So Jesus is saying, I've got sheep. And we've already talked about this back end of last year. We talked about being sheep. Why sheep? I don't know. Dumb animals, but we're called sheep. Maybe that's why we're called sheep. My sheep hear my voice. So if you're a sheep of God here, you're someone that's, that's surrendered your life to Jesus, accepted that you're a sinner, come before the cross, accepted the death of Jesus on your behalf, humbled yourself, repented, turned from your ways and, and you're walking for God, then you're a sheep. And he's saying, 
I'm telling you that you will hear my voice. You'll know my voice. You'll know my voice and you'll follow me. I'll speak to you. I'll communicate to you. And that communication will cause you to do something. How many of you know that if, I, if I'm standing here and Jesus speaks to me and says, follow me, if I'm following, it means movement, doesn't it? It doesn't say my sheep will hear my voice and they'll stay exactly where they are. I'm going to say something and you're going to move. And because you move, everything's going to become different. So I'm standing here now and the world looks like this, but I'm going to follow you over here. And now I'm in a different place. My place has changed. Things look a bit different and so on. And when God speaks, he wants to see things created. He wants to bring about transformation in our lives. He wants us to, we sung this morning about his word producing breakthroughs. I I believe God wants us to grow. How many of you believe God wants you to grow spiritually? Yep, about half of this room. That's a good start though. That's pretty good. How many of you believe that there are situations in your life right now, you look at them and you go, you know what, that's not exactly how God wants it to be. I believe God wants it to be different. Who fixed that? I think there are some situations in my world that right now are not where they should be. I believe that they can get better. I believe that there can be transformation and change. I believe there are areas of my world where I can can grow spiritually, I can grow relationally. I believe there are things in my world. I'm not a finished product. Who's a finished product in this room? None of us. So one of the ways that, 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 that God brings about that transformation and change is he says, I'm a communicating God. It's what I am by nature. I'm going to communicate things to you. My communication is not just to give you information. It's so that on the back of that communication, something is created and changed. I want to see creation and change. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. As we hear God's directions and follow them, we're taken to new places. We're taken to new places. John 6, 63, Jesus said this about his word. He said, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and their life. The words I speak to you are spirit and life. So, so there's something again about the words that God speaks that, have, that somehow in the big scheme of things, he connects these words that I've got to speak with this end result of life. John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes, still kills. I've come that you may have life. I want to give you life. And part of the way that life comes into you is it's got something to do with my communication to you. I'm going to communicate to you and the end result here is life. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, when Jesus was being tempted, he turns around and he says to the devil, uh, he answered and said, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Again, there's something about the words of God and this connection to us living or experiencing life. There's a connection right throughout between the Word of God, me somehow receiving that communication, acting on that communication, and life being a part of the end result of that. Because God wants to, I believe God wants to bless us, transform us, change us. He's for us, He's not against us. He's got good things in store for us. He's got great things in store for us. Now, if man does not live on bread alone, and we need to be hearing from God in order to flourish in this life, then it stands to reason that one of the reasons why some of us may not be flourishing in this life is because we're not hearing or discerning the voice of God. We're not discerning the voice of God in our own world. We're going through life, and we're just making decisions the best we can. We're not bad people, but we're not promised that we'll have a great life by basing our life and choices on just the best thing we think at the time. When we have a God in our world that wants to communicate to us, who's saying, hey, slow down, listen, I I want to communicate, I want to be involved in your world in that way, I want relationship, part of that is communication. And trust me, everything I'm saying to you has one end goal, that is life. It's the end goal of everything that I'm trying to say to you. Now here, I wonder... If I ask for a show of hands in this room, and I'm not asking for it, so please don't do it. If I ask for a show of hands, how many would say they feel like they are regularly aware of God's communication to them and therefore spiritually flourishing in this life? And then if I flip that question, I'm not asking for a show of hands, don't do it. I also wonder how many would say I'm aware that I'm not spiritually flourishing in this life. And it may be, if I'm honest, because I'm never aware of what God might be saying to me. I don't live with an awareness or even a conscious knowledge that he wants to speak to me. Therefore, I'm not really open to even trying to discern what may be God or may not be God. I'm just 
flying by the seat of my pants here doing the best I can. I'm just mimicking what, what my dad taught me when I'm just, I'm just living the same way my dad did because it's what I know and I'm just... Yet I've got this God there that says, I want to bring life to you. And one of the ways I bring life and transformation and change to you is I'm going to communicate some things. I want to communicate with you because I want relationship with you. I want to have relationship with you. So here's the deal. I want to take a couple of weeks, probably the next two weeks, and I want to share some reasons why we might be finding it hard to discern the voice of God in our own lives. Okay? Next couple of weeks, we're going to think about why is it and is it possible that we're struggling to discern the voice of God. Now, I say struggling to discern the voice of God because I believe that God is a good father and he's speaking all the time. I know some people will say, I never hear from God. I believe you do. It's just the capacity to discern what is God and what's not. Because as a good father, we communicate with our kids. We're either trying to save them or, or you know, even sometimes we're communicating to them, you are messing up. But we're doing it because we know if you listen to the fact that you're messing up, you'll make a change and maybe you'll do better. Because that's what I want. I want life for you. I want you to do better. And, and God is always speaking to us. I believe this. But I believe that we don't always discern the voice of God. But if we want to grow spiritually and we want to be all we're meant to be, and we want this thing called life that Jesus promised, we cannot think that there is a disconnect between what he's saying, us hearing and us responding to it, and this promise of life. There is a definite biblical connection between us being the people we're meant to be and doing the things we're meant to do and having this thing called abundant life. And I don't know about you, I want an abundant life. And that doesn't mean 10 jets and 7 houses and 15 cars. Forget all that stuff. I want abundant, abundant life to me is the life God wants me to have because I'm walking in daily obedience to him. I'm creating an environment by listening and obeying that God can bring into my world, this side of heaven, everything he wants to bring into my world because I'm not hindering it through disobedience or just not listening or just not thinking he's interested or thinking he doesn't care. I want to create that kind of world. So this week, I want to start by asking you one simple question. One simple question. This is like a foundational question. In the next couple of weeks, I've got 10. I'll, I'll be honest, I've got about 10 things, about 10 reasons why I think some of us may struggle to discern or hear the voice of God. But I'm just going to lay a foundation this week, and I want to ask you one question. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to just sit there, think about it, and move on. I want you to think about this question for the rest of the week. I want you to ask yourself this question for the rest of the week. So when you turn up next week, maybe we, we, we've got a bit more of an open page here to go dive in here and have a look at some of these other reasons. But before I ask you this question, I want to show you something. Everyone look up the screen. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to hear what God wants to say or do you want God to say what you want to hear? Do you genuinely want to hear what God wants to say or do you want God to say what you want to hear? Here's, anyone ever seen that movie, The Man with Two Brains? Old Steve Martin movie? No? It's quite a funny film. But he's met a new love interest and his wife's passed away and of course he loves his ex-wife but he's met this new... And he's just asking her, and I don't recommend you do this by the way if you've got a deceased person that we don't do this. But he's asking, is there any, do you have any problem with this relationship? And you can see everything that happened around him, everything that went on. And at the end of it, he came to the conclusion that he hadn't heard a thing yet. But I'm still open, whatever you want to say, go for it. And I think some of us are like that, aren't we? Some of us can be like that. We don't really want to hear what God wants to say. We want God to say what we want to hear. And if you're the kind of person that doesn't really want to hear what God wants to say, but just wants God to say what you want to hear, I think you're going to struggle to actually hear what God wants to say. But you'll be very open to everything that happens around you and discern it and work it into the narrative of God saying exactly what you want. See, all of us are like a bowling ball in life, aren't we? We're like a bowling ball. A bowling ball has a bias. You roll it down a green and it curves a certain way. It curves a certain way, bends a certain way. And when it comes to our lives, if we're brutally honest, we all have a bias when it comes to our own life. We, we have a bias when it comes to career path and choice and what we want to do with our life. We, we have a bit of a bias towards that. We have a bit of a bias towards what we want our children to do when they grow up. I, I remember a lovely couple many, many years ago, both very intelligent people, university educated, all this stuff, and they, they, I remember one of their uh, young boys saying, you know, I feel called, I feel like God is calling me to be a youth pastor um, and I'm, I, I should go to Bible college and become a youth pastor. But his parents thought that was a little bit beneath him, he was much smarter than that and should be doing better with his life and talked him out of it. The unfortunate end of that story, I guess, is to this day, last time I spoke to him, he wasn't really 
doing too well with the Lord, ended up uh, with, with children and, and, and all kinds of different situations. And I think about that boy and I think, you know, wouldn't it have been great to have a mum and dad that didn't have a bias and were open to possibly maybe the Lord does want my son to be a youth pastor of a church. And if that's the will of God, then that's the highest possible thing that's going to bring the best life to him. Maybe he won't earn the money that he might earn as a great educated scientist or doctor or something, but hey, he's going to have more of the kind of life God wants him to have by doing this than he's ever going to have by doing that. So we all have a bit of a bias. We have a bit of a bias towards the different situations and circumstances. If you've got a boss at work, you've probably got a bias towards your boss right now. You either like that boss or you kind of don't like that boss. And everything you hear and see it kind of gets filtered, doesn't it? Kind of through that bias. And as long as we have that bias, we have a tendency to just simply be hearing what we want to hear, thinking that God's saying what we want to hear, instead of genuinely being an open book and saying, God, speak, what, it is, what is it that you actually want to say to me? What is it that you want to say? I ask you again, do you want to hear what God wants to say, or do you want God to say to you what you want to hear? We had a really, really good friend of ours many, many years ago, and uh, she met this guy, and, uh, you know, she started to have attraction and feelings for him, and this guy had attraction and feelings for her. And this relationship began to develop. All of the people around her world, however, were seeing some things that maybe she couldn't see in the moment. And she was a lovely Christian girl, and she was praying. But you know what? The heart wants what the heart wants, doesn't it? And she really wanted this relationship with this particular person. And so she charged after this relationship with this guy in spite of all this great godly counsel she was getting from her leaders and, and different friends and, and so on. She charged off. And I remember it all came to a head one day when somebody shared with her that they felt like the Lord had spoken to them and they shared a word with her. And the word was that there, are, there, are, there is a wolf in sheep's clothing who is trying to lead you astray. Beware the wolf. Everybody around her world that heard about that wolf knew straight away, I, we've all got a feeling this guy is the wolf. So she went and shared it with this guy and the guy turned it around and said, you know what, you really love me and we love each other. You know who the wolf is? It's all these people that are telling you. And so on the basis of that, you see, I don't think she really wanted to hear what God had to say. She wanted God to say what she wanted to hear. And that was all it took was that one little thing and she ran off and got married. It didn't last too long before we started drinking heavily, getting drunk every night before he started physically abusing her. She went through a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of broken relationships, and in the end, the marriage fell apart. Do, 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 we, do we have in our hearts an openness that we want to hear what God wants to say, or do we want God to say what we want to hear? Because that is a foundational thing. It's going to have a massive big impact on your life, and what you hear and what you don't hear, and your capacity to uh, discern the voice of God, and to obey God, and to step out in the things that God has for you, and to live the kind of life that God wants for you. I don't want to get right into it now, but there's a great story in Numbers chapter 22. It's a story of a guy called Balaam. Anyone know about a fellow called Balaam? Why do you know about Balaam? Exactly. Everyone knows about Balaam because Shrek's best mate talked to him. The donkey spoke to him. If you go and have a look at the, the story, um, ba ba Balaam is not a false prophet, by the way. Balaam was not ever biblically sort of portrayed as a false prophet. He was a bad prophet. He was a wicked prophet. He heard from God. Very clearly, he heard from God. But we've got this story in Numbers chapter 22 where the children of Israel are coming across into the, the land of the Moabites, I think it is, and, the, and the, the Moabite king sends some people, go to grab Balaam, this prophet, tell him to come and curse this scourge of Israel that's coming across, curse them and I'll load you up with money. And, and he tells them, wait here, I'm going to go and pray and ask God, what should I do? He prays, he asks the Lord and the Lord speaks to him very clearly, doesn't he? God says to him, no, no, these people are blessed, these are my people, you, you can't curse them. So he goes back to the entourage and says, look, I'm really, really sorry, got some bad news for you, I can't curse them because God won't let me curse them, they're, going, they're blessed. So the entourage go back to the king and go to the king. This is what he said. The king goes, no, 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 go back again. Go back again and, and just throw the kitchen sink at the dude, whatever he wants. Just go and tell him. So he go, they, goes back and this time Balaam says, look, I told you last time I can't curse him if God says no, but you guys all wait here. I'm going to go and ask God again. I'm going to ask God the same question I just asked him again. Even though I have a really clear answer... God said, no. 
But I'm going to go back and ask him again. Just wait here. And it's interesting because if you look at the story, it says that they stayed the night. And he goes back to God and he goes, well, God, here's the deal. Blah, blah, blah. This time he hears God say, look, go with him, but you can only say what I say. Actually, what he says is if they come to you in the morning to get you, go with them. Long story short, Balaam gets up real early, just gets his gear ready, and next thing you know, he runs off with them. And we all know the story. He's got this donkey, doesn't he, right? And he's riding this donkey, and the donkey's just going left, right, and all over the shop. And he's getting really angry at the donkey. You can read this in Numbers 22. So he jumps off the donkey at one point and goes to go toe-to-toe with donkey. And the donkey begins to speak to him. You ever been spoken to by an ass? Don't say right now. And so this donkey speaks to him, and he's going to kill the donkey. And next thing you know, the angel of the Lord appears. And the angel of the Lord says, Balaam, you egghead. If that donkey didn't do what it did, I was going to kill you. I was going to take your life. I'm going to take your life. Now, later on down the track, I think it's numbers 35 somewhere there, you'll, you'll, you'll find this. The angel ends up saying, look, go with them. And, but I don't want you to say anything other than what I say. So God takes this situation and he still uses it for good. He turns it around and, 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 and Balaam goes. But the angel was standing there because the angel was going to kill him. So I've, I'm pretty positive that what he heard the second time from God maybe was a little bit disingenuous, maybe wasn't the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, because the angel was going to kill him. He'd already heard from God, but he decided, no, 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 I really want that reward. And I'm going to find a way to get that reward. And later on, he actually does find a way to get that reward. He can't curse Israel, so what does he do? He tells the Moabites, here's the way you get to Israel. Get your women to go and befriend the Israelite men. Get a few relationships going there, and you'll get them that way. And guess what? They did. You read that later on in Numbers. It all came on the back of Balaam. Now, if you go to the book of Jude, and I think I've got some passages there. Book of Jude, Jude talks about the, the, the greed. Of Balaam. Have we got that Jude verse there somewhere? I'm like that up. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They've rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They've been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Balaam's error. If, if you go to the New King James, I think it might word that just a little bit differently. Balaam's wickedness, Balaam's greed is what it means. It means that Balaam was greedy. The reason he made that decision, did what he did, because in his heart was something that he really wanted. He really wanted that reward, and he was going to hear and do whatever it took to get that reward. That's what he was going to do. Peter references him later on as well. And uh, Peter says, I've got it, you got it up there too? Here, they've forsaken the right way. This is speaking of false prophets and bad teachers and leaders, people leading people astray. He says, they've forsaken the right way, gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Baal, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. What's it saying? It's saying that Balaam had something in his heart already that he wanted. He had a bias towards wanting that reward. And here's the thing, if you have a bias towards that, you will eventually start to hear whatever. You'll put two and two together and you'll make five. Because what you want, what the heart wants, what you set your mind on, you'll start hearing things pointing you in that direction because you're not starting with a clean, surrendered slate before God. A clean, surrendered heart before the Lord. God, what do you want to say to me about my life? What do you want to say to me about this situation? God, what do you want to say to me about... Some people in, in, some, some, some of us have got a bias towards we're too busy to serve. That's a reality. Some of us have already got a bias, I'm too busy to serve in your local church. I'm just too busy. It's a bias. And so when we pray, we're not really praying with an open heart. Well, Lord, come on. To, no, because I've already got my bias. I'm just too busy. Or, or I, I'm, I'm too poor to financially give or help out or... I can't help my neighbour with that because I'm, I'm just, I don't have... We've got these biases all over the place and it's normal human nature, it's not a bad thing. But when it comes to hearing from God, we've got to ask ourselves this foundational question. Do you want to hear what God wants to say or do you want God to say what you want to hear? Either way, you're probably going to hear it. Either way, you're probably going to hear it. Men are often accused of having selective hearing. Any men here with selective hearing? Rodney's shaking his head. Elaine's looking at him like, wow. <laughs> Children have selective hearing. They're sitting on the PlayStation playing around. And da-da-da. Clean your room. And they, I didn't hear, I didn't hear, I can't hear. You know? Go mow the lawn. I can't hear. You want some ice cream? Yep! You want 20 bucks? Yep! Best mates on the phone? Come in! Can you do the dishes? 
Sorry, I didn't hear. I didn't hear you say that. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you say put the toilet seat down. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Some of us have got spiritual selective hearing. We've got spiritual selective hearing. And I guess the thing I want you to think about this week is as we look at these 10 reasons why it is that sometimes we fail to discern and to hear the voice of God. Ask yourself the question honestly. In my world, I have many biases. I do. I'm just being honest. How surrendered am I to the purposes and the plans of God? for my life. When I say that, I'm not just saying the call of God. People think call of God is in vocation. I'm talking about daily, the way I handle situations at work, the way I handle situations at school, the way I, I, I do this, do that. God, God has this capacity and desire and heart felt want to communicate to us. So at the end of that communication, we would obey him. And at the end of that obedience, it would bring into our world this thing that Jesus called life. We're going to have a life that is shaped and created by what God wants to bring into us, or we can have a life of our own choosing, and that's the beauty of having a free will. But I reckon I'm going to get there one day and look back and go, you know what, God? I actually had no idea you were so good, had no idea that you were uh, so keen to speak to me in these areas. I had no idea, God, that if I had followed your path, it could have been so wonderful. Maybe I got myself in a whole bunch of problems and situations because I have this natural bias. And God, I blocked your voice out because the truth is I didn't want to hear what you wanted to say. I wanted you to say to me what it was that I want to hear. So I want you to think about that question this week. Next couple of weeks, we're going to look at these 10 reasons why I believe sometimes we fail. And it's not going to be for everybody, but sometimes we fail to discern the voice of God. Because I reckon for 2022, 2023, one of the things that I'm, I know I'm doing in my own world is I'm recognizing those biases more and trying to become a more surrendered person to Jesus and saying, God, I, 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 want, to, I, want, to, I want to hear, even if it's painful, even if it hurts. My friend being told by all those people around her, this guy's a wolf, I'm telling you, that would have been temporary pain, it would have hurt had she responded to that. Yep, it would have been a lot of tears and a lot of heartbreak, but I'm telling you, what God had on the other side of that was way more better type of a life than the life she ended up with by following her own bias. God wants relationship with you way more than you want it with him. And the more we surrender to him, it's our way of acknowledging we actually believe that and we trust that God. And so we're laying all our biases down to the best of our ability and we're saying, Lord, would you speak to us what it is that you want to say? I don't want you to say what I want to hear. I want you to speak what's from your heart to me. Amen. Yep, Lord, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together. God, I, I, I do pray for each person in this room. Lord, these next seven days, we are going to have so many things run through our head, come across our table, so many things that, uh, Father, are going to be validly extremely important. But somehow in the mix of that, God, I pray that each of us would be brutally honest. We would get with the Holy Spirit, we would sit quietly, and we would listen. And God, we would ask this question, do we want to actually hear what you want to say to us about our life? Or do we want you to say what we want to hear? God, as each person leaves this room, seal this question in our hearts, God. We want to grow spiritually. We want to be the people you want us to be, God. And God, I want to squeeze every ounce. When you said you want to give me an abundant life, God, I want to squeeze every bit of juice out of whatever abundant life means with the time I've got down here, Father. And Lord, as we go as well this week, there are going to be people out there, they don't know you. They don't know that you died for them. They don't know that you care for them, Lord. In fact, they probably feel like nobody cares. So Lord, we pray this week, give us the opportunity to speak to and to show the love of God and add value to some of these people out there. Give us the blessing, the privilege of sharing your love and reality with somebody this week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.